Tyler Dickeroff. Today, Monday Newswire, joined by producer Alex. He's here. But as well, my friend, Chris Allen. Chris, I asked you to join us today. Today, we are talking about Hurricane Helene and the devastation in central and western New York, the mountain areas of North Carolina. I said, why did I say New York? North Carolina. Oh, <laughs> goodness. It's okay, North Carolina. Like, I'm good. getting excited here. Um, you have been boots on the ground in Asheville. I've seen your posting from LinkedIn. We're live on LinkedIn as well to share this. But what uh, we're talking about today is what's going on, what's happened, mm-hmm. how it caught everyone by surprise. And so I uh, reached out yesterday. I said, hey, would you join us and kind of give us your real, you know, to your hand touching hand What's going on in so many of these communities in Western yeah. North Carolina? Yeah. Well, Tyler, thanks for having me on. Um, really quickly, let's let's just try and raise awareness to what's really happening. Yeah. Um, for all of the viewers here, I happen to be in Greenville, South Carolina, on Thursday and Friday of the storm, and I was having an all team meeting. We had a member of my team from Romania with us, and we were in the middle of the storm. We were protected by a hotel and didn't really know the damage until uh, my colleague Brennan found out that she had dropped her three-year-old son off with her in-laws who lived in Asheville. Oh, and she lost communication with them. She had no communication with her three-year-old son or her in-laws for about 48 hours. Oh. And so that raised the initial awareness, but also anxiety around what was really going on. Yeah. And so by Saturday night, uh, we did hear from her in-laws. Uh, Sunday morning at 9 a.m., we heard from her three-year-old son. All that to say, that obviously meant we need to do something about this. And so uh, I run an organization called Always About People. Yeah. Uh, my colleague Brennan uh, was immediately put into action. And that's what put us into touch with everybody on the ground. There's an organization there, the Asheville Dream Center, that has been coordinating supplies, gathering people together, getting needs to individual churches. And so we coordinated through the Asheville Dream Center. We went up on Friday and we got to see what it actually looked like on the ground. What I would just tell everybody is this, in areas that were higher, it almost looks like there's no damage. In any areas that are low, where water was 15 feet higher than it normally is, it's total devastation. And um, there were images of uh, the Biltmore Village. Yeah. Uh, Looks like you're in a third world country. Uh, We were driving through as antique restoration companies were pulling out soaked antique furniture out of uh, the Grand Bohemian Hotel. But then you go up the street a quarter mile, and it doesn't even look like anything was touched. Yeah. Um, wow. the, the hospital, Mission Hospital in Asheville, um, everything is fine, except for the fact that they have no water. So electricity was being restored, but now you see 20 semi-truck tankers all lined up around the outside of the hospital. I can't imagine what it's like to take care of patients without toilets, without yeah. drinking water, without showers, without any running water at all. And so tankers are just lined up front to back and they're running water into the hospital. I would say that the biggest issue right now is running water, which we did get clarification that Asheville's main water treatment facility, both the 36 inch and the redundant 24 inch lines have been totally destroyed with no real guess as to when those will be restored. Mm. Now, You go outside of downtown Asheville into the smaller areas, the rural areas that are lower, and that's where you'll see that houses were literally washed away. Hmm. The only other thing that I can say is that our estimates on loss of life are way under where they should be. Um, There are, I mean, missing reports of hundreds, 600 to 1,000 missing people. And they have to leave it as a missing person report until they actually recover a body and identify it. Mm. Uh, but we know for a fact that, the, that there's a massive loss of life in this as well. And so, again, what I would just tell everybody is um, there are some incredible organizations 
uh, that are working here, um, people have supplies now, but water is the biggest issue. And now we've got to move into a cleanup phase. Mm -hmm. And so volunteers are needed for helping clean up. And then where I think I would just encourage people to be giving would be um, organizations that are working with local churches or local organizations who know what the needs are in that specific location, because it can change in one yeah. part of Asheville. It's fine. And they need water in another part outside of Asheville, total devastation. They need warm clothes. They need a warm house. They might need housing. They might need all kinds of things. And this is going to displace people for years because yeah. jobs are lost. Homes are lost. Belongings are lost. And those are those areas where devastation hits. So there's my update from North Carolina. I know you just have a couple minutes with us and thank you again for squeezing this in. One thing that I, I want to just kind of tap on, you gave a great outline of what's reality, where to help. Where do you see and have you seen, we've seen a lot of this misinformation or, you know, kind of the political banter. I'll, I'll just label it as it is. How would you encourage people that are watching this to kind of clear through that and say, here's, you, you meant, you just mentioned the focus, but really reemphasizing where do we need to keep our focus at? So I don't know what's true and what's not. Um, what I know is this. We saw National Guard helicopters flying over Asheville, dropping supplies into areas of the city that you can't get to via any vehicle. So, I mean, like roads are gone, bridges are gone. There's no way in or out. And so th there are people at work. I can't speak to where money is flowing, yeah. where money out of the government's flowing, yeah. who's involved. I don't know. What I do know is this. Um, I'm watching people rise up and help other people. The humanity is a beautiful thing. Like it, it, it makes me yeah. want to cry. But when you, when you watch people who just care about other people, that's the powerful thing. And so um, as, as much as you could be involved in people's lives and giving to organizations that are helping people, uh, that would be my encouragement. Um, I think right now, uh, a, a couple quick thoughts, Samaritan's Purse is mm -hmm. mobilizing hundreds of volunteers for cleanup. I think that's unbelievable. Um, the, in, the initial wave of supplies and food, they're fine. Um, like grocery stores are stocked, gas is fine electricity is being restored in certain areas um in areas where there's no electricity generators are there in areas where there's no internet starlink has been given to lots and lots of people the main issue is clean water i mean imagine having a family without being able to take showers without being able to use toilets and without having water to drink plastic water bottles are not the solution and so I yeah. just think like th those are a few things we need to be thinking of, yeah. but um, jobs will be needed. Housing will be needed. And a, a lot of people will be displaced. And so I, j I just think it'll be years before some of that's restored as well. Chris, you just, yeah. you mentioned a little earlier, I just want to ask. So there's, there are families stuck there because still to this day, uh, there's no way to get out, right? The roads and the bridges are gone. Correct. And, and we know that we know that there are still families that or at least communities that they're trying to get to because there's just no way to get to them. Um, there are hundreds of emergency rescue personnel from all over the East Coast that are sleeping in churches and in church parking lots that are going out every day to find whoever's left. Um, but. I mean, in some of these smaller communities, you have a dirt or gravel road and it's been yeah. completely washed out. So there's just no way in and out. I mean, yeah. we know of story after story of communities cutting their way out with chainsaws just to get out. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just I think that's that's the concern now. Yeah. Chris, again, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have to jump, but thank you for yeah. sharing with us. Thank you for hopping on. Good to see you, buddy. We, we need to just do a real podcast here uh, soon. But uh, thank you again, man. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, wow, Tyler. That's incredible. Well, you know, 
getting prepared for this, this is probably one of the, and I say that don't not flippantly, this has been one of the, uh, I, I would say Monday newswires that I prepared the most for partly trying to collect information and not having information. And, and so when I, you know, reached out to Chris, cause I saw what he was sharing. It's like, here's somebody boots on the ground. And uh, yeah. I didn't know the story about his staff member. And, and like, I can just imagine as you having a, a, you know, kids that age, just imagine 48 hours having no idea. Are they, you know, safe, anything. Um, yeah, that, you know, you mentioned, incredible. you know, some of these communities cut off. And I think that is a piece that it, it's hard to understand. I, I was thinking about this. We live in a, a part of the country where wildfires happen. Uh, a year ago, last August, we live in an area where there were two large fires that um, burnt down over 350 homes in, in the you know greater Spokane area. You know, you live in an area where hurricanes affect yeah. uh, Florida, depending on where it's coming. There's another one coming another through one coming here in the now. next couple of days. Yeah. Um, I, I grew up in Ohio where we have, you know, tornadoes and, and those things. And I don't know of a natural disaster that is more absolutely destructive than flooding. And when you yeah. hear Chris talk about roads washed out, bridges, bridges washed out, like entire homes just gone. And, and, you know, it doesn't take long to, to scour the internet to find some of these examples. He made the comment, it, it's going to be weeks, months, years. And yeah. I would contend some of the absolute, you know, you think about the Grand Canyon, how it was made with water, you know, the yeah, power powerful. of water. There are canyons within the, the Western North Carolina mountains that you may never get to again because of the amount of work that it's going to take to rebuild those roads, it, it, it's really transformative. And I don't think we as a country, must, much less a region, really understands how impactful. You know, I was thinking back, you know, Katrina and the flooding Katrina. and everything and, and how it affected, you know, the lower um, New Orleans. To be honest, I think this may be more generationally impactful as crazy as that is to say i think it's i mean i think it's very similar there's there's three hurricane or two other hurricanes that stand out uh hurricane andrew in 1994 okay. that hit uh homestead my and, and in fact my cousins lived in homestead they actually had to live in the northeast with m us and my uncle for about six months to a year yeah they were totally displaced. And then Katrina, I was going to say, was the other one that this reminds me of. You know, what's the difference between both those is geographically, right? Just the mountains are just yeah. so much harder to get through. Like they're in like valleys, you know, yeah. when, with Katrina and, and Andrew, you know, they're flat. It's flat. Yeah. You can pretty much see everything there. You're in dense woods, mountains. It's much more difficult. Well, to... just the impact of the water funneling into those canyons. Yeah. And, you know, you see, you know, I, I read one report in one area where water was raising 10 feet an hour, That's 10 crazy. feet an hour and, you know, uh, Appalachian Nuts. state, uh, thankfully they beat Michigan years ago. Appalachian state is based in Boone, North Carolina. And I was reading some reports preparing for this again, college students being trapped in water because there was one apartment complex that was, you know, close to and flooded. And they yeah. couldn't get out. They were on the verge of getting swept away. There was a, a an interview done with them, and it happened that quick. There was there wasn't a lot of forewarning and reading yeah. the news reports of the meteorological. One of the things that I didn't understand, of course, not living in that region, is how much rain occurred the week before. And right. so that caused a lot of the, the waterways to swell, caused a lot of the, the ground to get saturated with water, which, you know, brings on the mudslides. I've been a part of that in California where we had, you know, torrential rains. I got stuck yeah. in a mudslide once and it was uh, in the grapevine area where it just, it had been raining really heavy. And then we just get a much heavier spot of rain and it just takes everything with it, washed out the roadway. Um, yeah. And so those things gonna, happen, but yeah. to the dynamic, the, 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 the massive effect, like uh, Chris was sharing is pretty astounding. Yeah. And, and you brought up a good point where if you paid attention, cause I, I was in Florida, I live in Florida. Yeah, um, yeah. The storm moved off. It wasn't going to go hit us. We were on the uh, Atlantic side uh, on the East side. And so it, nothing really happened, but I, you know, I paid attention to the news and for the first few days, 
I mean, no one ever mentioned how devastating this could be to like areas like North Carolina. I don't think I saw a whisper of it across any media AccuWeather, weather.com. Uh, it was all basic like Florida and it's going to go through Georgia. And then all of a sudden over the last few days, everything started popping up around North Carolina. And there was this like, it, it, it was silent for a while, you know, like there was no media attention. And then all of a sudden you get these tri like 30, like today I read $30 billion in damage. In Which that I think as Chris just shared, that's probably a gross underestimation. Right. I mean, that's a crazy number. And and then the death toll being way down, way lower than what's estimated. And I think, yeah, the whole reporting on this uh, just awful, awful um, well, I, I storm. Mean, I think I just... shared with you and there was a USA Today uh, article that I, I picked up this morning and, you know, kind of documented a few of these things, whether it's greater Asheville, as as Chris was referring to. And, you know, just kind of storm preparation. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh, we have to worry about this. Oh, you know, we've right. had this rain system. We have to worry about this. Oh, hey, you guys better be alarmed. And, you know, one of the things that, hey, expect catastrophic flooding. And yet there was never any announcement in the area to evacuate. Yeah. And, you know, part of that is like and having been, again, in a region where we have wildfires and it's just kind of like, uh, all right, do we need to evacuate? Like, right, is, right. It, is it close enough? Is it understanding? And, and fires move fast. Flooding moves faster and, you yeah, know, it, it is, you know, to consideration um, and it, it just that lack of preparedness. But I think as well, it just cascaded and generally whether I'm not speaking for the meteorologists that work in that area, overlook that area, but I'm just saying from my perspective, living in the Western U S it was like, Oh, it's going to hit Florida. Oh, it hit Florida. And they were prepared okay, it's moving on. And as a lot of storms move on into, you know, the East Coast, they'll get heavy raining, but it just dissipates. Correct. Right? It just, yeah. and what I learned is there was a cold front that brought in those storms. And then when it met, it was biblical. And, and that's the yeah. definition of it. It is a biblical hundred year, had never seen water this high, had washed out roads that have been in part of that, you know, part Bridges. of uh, yeah. yeah, those areas for well over 100 years. Yeah. And, um, you know, to his point, uh, what Chris shared with us is the rebuilding, the loss of jobs, the loss of tourism in that part of the country it is going to affect a lot of people. And here's where I want to kind of transition is what does that next step look for those people? And what do we as a community, as a, as a global, you know, national community yeah, need to do to support these people. I mean, it's, a, I mean, yeah. Thinking about the families and that three-year-old, like I just think about my son and you know, how little and yeah. you know, just someone not knowing what's going on, but just being terrified and it's, it's awful. And, you know, makes you want to go over there. But I think, you know, like Chris said, you know, there has to be a lot of more, a lot more media attention on this, um, than than it has been and also the the reporting because he, even he was like i don't even know what what's real and not real because he's so in, in like he's boots on the ground there helping yeah. so for anyone that's not there i think you know it's trying to first for first of all get the right information of what is needed and what can be helped um for those people and those families to get out of there and out of that situation and then for me uh, i mean that's a beautiful part of the country by the way yeah um love going up there and, and hiking and uh, up in the mountains and, and then snow in the winter time. But I mean, to get, we, it sounds like we need to be sending uh, and donating to the local communities, like very yeah. specifically to these churches in that area. Cause like Chris alluded to some people need water, some people need warm clothes. Yeah. Um, and I think we just need to raise as much awareness and, and, you know, get in touch with people, you know, they have Starlink and people like Chris and others and understanding, okay, where can we shift our communities, our own communities and reach um, to help some of these families out? Because it seems like it's going to be happening for months and months on end until, you know, these people can get some sort of, you know, zap back to yeah. uh, normality. Um, 
So as, as you're watching and those listening, uh, Chris mentioned Samaritan's Purse. Um, there's another organization that I know helped tr- tr- helps tremendously in these types of situations, Convoy of Hope. They've been on the ground. Um, that's an organization I know well, know the, uh, the CEO. I've had him as a podcast guest before, uh, Hal Donaldson. And in those areas, I think when you start to go to those verified uh, pro- nonprofit organizations, aid organizations can help you mitigate maybe some of the Less than, you know, one of the things talk about misinformation and picking this up, whether it's overseas trying to cause disinformation or the money grab, uh, be careful of those through, you know, I would say non-verified giving, just that's my personal suggestion. Uh, And then the other piece is, I think, whether it comes to plumbing, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, major plumbing, when it comes to, you know, the restoration, the dirt movement, the road building we're going to have an opportunity and I hope whether it's through some of our national guard, through some of our organizations there where we can really help rebuild these communities in a quick way, because that gives people the opportunity that have those skills to put them to use. Quite honestly, we know that we don't have as many with those skills because of the lack of emphasis over the years. But if you do, you're watching, you know, people uh, or, you know, organizations that are involved in that stuff, the ability to support, I think is there because the needs are, are not going to be over. And, and here we are, middle of October, and all of a sudden, now we start running into cold weather. We start running into more inclement weather where it's harder to live without a home, heat, yeah. uh, water, especially you start getting into freezing water situations that's not buried lines. Those things start to have a major um, confounder on everything we're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, there's another hurricane we, we talked about a little earlier, Milton, coming through Florida. Actually, I, I'm in New Jersey right now, so I, I will miss this one. I have a brother-in-law who's down there because um, it's going to cut through yes. Tampa and that it's going to pass right by us on the tail end. So praying that that thing isn't isn't horrible. Um, and will you sent me an article, Tyler, about the insurance. Yeah. What? Tell me, can you d- uh, explain that to the guests, to the audience? So- one of the things that and I didn't get a chance to ask Chris, I know his time was limited. Yeah. Chris's background, he actually used to work in the mortgage industry. Uh, it was much more of a people, you know, kind of culture, um, but he worked in an industry. He worked for Movement Mortgage for many years, and that's how I got to know him through our mutual friends. And, and one thing that has changed dramatically mm-hmm. is we have this drive of insurance organizations that want to make more money for their shareholders. And that means they pay out less money. So there's a lot of policies i'm not speaking i don't know exact but there are policies like in our region you know where we have fires that does not protect against fires wildfires we have regions you know i know in florida it's been an issue when it comes to hurricanes and flooding it's almost a guess speculation of mine i don't know exactly where you're going to find situations where homes that are absolutely destroyed businesses destroyed that have no flood insurance And I think that's the thing that's going to play out here. We talk about insurance and and, and we have this generally good feeling that, oh, okay, you have insurance, you're going to be taken care of. Well, the time that it takes to get it, the amount of process that it takes to get it. And, you know, yes, there are funds available from FEMA, but it takes a while. And when you think about somebody that lost everything, you know, I was watching uh, and there was a, a campground that lost everything. It was washed out, gone. Yeah. And, you know, what they can apply for, they actually had people that were booking spots at their campground through their payment as a donation because of they lost everything. And they had built this amazing, beautiful, gorgeous on a river bend campground, and it was all flooded, washed away. Like the amount of dirt moved. Right. is phenomenal. So when we talk about insurance and and it, it isn't easy enough to say, oh, insurance will cover it. There's a lot of red tape there and it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be covered and or we've gotten to the point where insurance companies, and it's not a, a shot over the bow on insurance companies, but insurance companies want to maximize their profit and not maximize their payout and I to know. their uh, <sighs> patrons. No, I mean, I... I get it. They're running a business, but like at what point, you know, how catastrophic does it have to get before the leaders of the, some of these organizations just say, Hey, maybe we didn't cover it or we couldn't cover it, but when do we donate? When do we, when do we, you know, the billions and billions of dollars that they make 
and have like when do when does the leadership step up and say hey too many people died families displaced like we got to do something more i mean they know what kind of business they're in they're in a devastation business um you know uh, and uh, yeah that that to me is like like chris had mentioned you know the, the best part about what is he sees is this the human the humanity and the help that one another every neighbors you know coming in and people coming in from out of town helping one another i think you know big organizations if there's places in north carolina that were not affected if they can come in and help with both people and and monetary assets to help revitalize that area um the government i i don't know what is happening the the last thing as i was reading was just about fly no fly you can fly just people trying to just do their best to get a chopper in there and help and yeah. then you know it's like what the hell's going on man why yeah. people just trying yeah. to help i mean people. it's it is uh, it's challenging. It's difficult, um, and I think the part of it is is that there's going to be ongoing needs. And if you're in a place and you have a desire to needs, whether it's physical needs, financial needs, um, those other pieces, um, there's an opportunity to be a a good part of society and yeah. not get politically bent and bound um, by it. And you know, when when you engage in all the rhetoric and the fighting you take focus away from the true needs. So yeah. um, there we go. That's the Monday Newswire update. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for watching on LinkedIn. Make sure you subscribe. Uh, check out my newsletter that I release each week as well. Podcast release on Mon on Wednesday. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure hit subscribe, hit the little bell. So that way you get notified each time. Uh, until next time, have a good one. Choose to lead with impact.